Uh, where should we begin, Mark? <laughs> I want to talk. I, I want to talk about the cosmos. There's so much other stuff. You you have you t you talk about so much other stuff, but I want to talk about the cosmos, the end of the upside down cosmos, and get into. I am just going to put it out there. I am not convinced we landed on the moon. I'm not convinced. Um, so I get called a moon landing denier by anybody who, you know, I don't ever say that out loud much because people attack. It, it's This is, again, it's the one subject that people will really come after you over. Um, but they put all of the, and this, this is, you know, I don't want to talk about the moon landing necessarily because there's so much to talk about with the universe, but this is just a showcasing of what they try to tell us when it comes to the universe, right? Where they fed us this story and then it's, you know, they're like, yeah, we landed, we put people on the moon. Oh, but we just so happened to never go back really right after these three years during the space race. We just so happened to lose the tapes. <laughs> that to me is like the biggest red flag. Oh, you don't have the tapes anymore. So you have no data, no telemetry data. It's all gone. You don't have the original video. You don't have any of this. Um, they also say, oh, and then there was that, that scandal where the astronauts, the Apollo 11 astronauts went and gave moon rocks, you know, as like token gifts and they gave it to, and then the Netherlands, I think they gave it to the Netherlands was one of the many, which many of the now, I mean, you'd think if you received as like an, if you're an ambassador and you received a moon rock from one of the Apollo 11 guys, you would think that you would, your country would house this in like a glass case, uh, like in a glass case, like in the embassy or something, many of them have lost them. You know, you go around asking, where's the moon rock that you were given by Apollo 11? They're like, nah, we don't have it anymore. But then the Netherlands were like, well, we had it. But then when we tested it, we found out it wasn't a moon rock. <laughs> it was like <laughs> yeah. from somewhere, you know, on <clears throat> here on earth. Um, so it's like really difficult to believe. So what, what is your, what's going on with the universe and everything that we've been taught? Yeah, it's interesting you started with NASA and space <clears throat> exploration. <clears throat> excuse me, because I think that's where most people go initially. But think about it in, in the course of human history. For a long time, we didn't have space exploration. It's only been the last, you know, under 100 years. And yeah. people did have very strong beliefs about the cosmos. But I do think it's natural to ask those questions. And the telemetry tapes, the fact that they don't exist anymore. And in my book, I quote NASA admitting this. That's a big deal. And there are just so many anomalies there. Uh, but what I try to do in the book, actually, I don't talk about that until chapter six, because I think attacking some of the basic physics is really important because people I found get locked into a model because of physics that they don't even know that they're relying on. And I just want to describe a little chain of events that to me is a house of cards that should make everyone question the cosmos. And it starts with Newton's gravity, very basic stuff, <clears throat> where if you drop an apple, it falls to the ground. And the belief is that it falls to the ground because the earth, the earth has a big mass and mass attracts mass, and the mass of the apple is less than the mass of the earth, so it falls down. The question isn't, why does the app, isn't whether the apple falls, we know it does. The question is, is mass attracting mass? So the model from Newton was that mass attracts mass. The problem is that it doesn't always work. So Newton's gravity cannot predict, for example, Mercury's orbit around the sun. So that's a pretty big deal, that it's got some big holes, that it's, it's not a comprehensive model. So what happened next? Einstein had a revised version of gravity where mass is bending space-time. It's not really mass attracting mass, it's that literally when you have mass in the universe, it's bending the fabric of reality, and that brings things closer and farther away from things. The problem is that starting in 1933, Fritz Zwicky, who was an astronomer, he was looking at the coma cluster of galaxies. And he said that based on the assumptions of gravity and Einstein's gravity, everything was way off. Basically, there was under 1% of the mass that should have been there in order for his observations to make sense. So instead of saying, we should just question gravity, they said, no, we discovered dark matter. They plugged in dark matter and said, well, it must be there. And so there's this whole study now of dark matter. The problem is, I wanna read you a direct quote, because it's so powerful, at least for me, is that in 2023, a group of physicists led by Pavel Krupa, he's a uh, astrophysicist at the University of Bonn, um, he says they have falsified dark matter. And by the way, dark matter is supposed to make up about 25% of the universe. And if you combine dark energy, dark matter and dark energy together make up 96% of the universe. That means according to conventional physics, only 4% of the universe is understood. But I want to read you a quote from Pavel Krupa. Actually, this is a 2022 article. 
And he said, a simple test suggests that dark matter does not in fact exist. If it did, we would expect lighter galaxies orbiting heavier ones to be slowed down by dark matter particles, but we detect no such slowdown. The implications of this are nothing short of a revision of Einstein's theory of gravitation. Why the scientific community is in denial about the falsification of the dark matter model is a question that requires both a sociological and a philosophical explanation. Right. So they just make these assertions. I mean, this, but this is how it's all, this is why it's so, um, why I don't understand why questioning the universe is so controversial, why questioning NASA, why questioning any of this is so controversial when throughout, I mean, just look at history. We know that, you know, they, they, they would debunk themselves, right? They'd say, oh, the, or at least they claimed, they would say the earth you know, the sun, the earth is stationary and everything revolves around the earth. And then they say, oh, no, never mind. Everything's revolving around the sun. And then, you know, at one point they, oh, Pluto's a planet. Oh, never mind. Pluto's not a planet. You know, it's it's like they keep coming up with what we, they assert something. And then later on they say, okay, it no longer is that assertion. But anybody who questioned the assertion while it was an assertion is suddenly a lunatic or just anti-science. And it's like, well, eventually you're going to come around and say that none of this is that what you just believed was not real. The dark matter issue is a significant issue because they've never been able to. I mean, they, they just claim that there's this matter that exists, but they don't know anything about it. Right. <clears throat> and it's needed to prop up the entire cosmology. So <laughs> right. think about how significant that is. If it's been falsified, whoa. Right. And that's the problem. They don't want it falsified because it would disrupt all of the others and then they have to start from square one again and they don't want to have to do that i think so because all of a sudden everything's on the table if you have to rethink the basics of gravity and motion we have to rethink the big bang we have to rethink like you said what's known as geocentrism versus heliocentrism geocentrism is earth is at the center heliocentrism is the current model that we revolve around the sun at the center we have to rethink potentially the mechanics of Earth, the shape of Earth, all this stuff to me is becomes fair game if the basics are wrong of cosmology. So you're really exploring just, so that's like way bigger than just, oh, the moon landing is is questionable um, or whatever. And I always say, look, like I've always, I've always been interested in talking to people who believe the flat Earth theory, for example. People say, oh, how could you ever entertain that idea? I've never, I've never been out in my own spaceship and seen the earth, you know, from, I have to believe everything I believe when it comes to whether or not the earth is, is round or, um, or what's out in space or any of this stuff. I just have to take it really on faith. I was just saying, well, I'm it really, it's, it's a faith belief. I have to believe that the person isn't lying to me because I cannot verify for myself. And I, so I don't believe anything unless I can verify it for myself, which yeah. which is most stuff. So most stuff I have to take on faith. That's just the reality of life, I think. Most things, I mean, I'm not gonna take the time to go and become an astrophysicist. I'm not gonna take the time to become a biologist. I'm not gonna take the time, you know, I'm not gonna throughout my life be able to do all of these things. So a lot of it is just taken on faith rather in and, and belief, right. <clears throat> not on fact. We're, we are told to believe certain agencies, especially as it pertains to the things that are really high up and, and out there, we have to rely on a very small number of people. But even if we, and, and let me just add, if your audience is interested, you can find that, that so many of the images are CGI or composite that you see, they're not actually just an, an innocent image of what's actually there. And even in spite of that, we don't have many images that you'd expect. Let's say with regard to Earth's rotation and shape, it would be really nice to have continuous footage from space, seeing the full earth doing a full rotation as a sphere with no interruptions. And you'd wanna see buildings standing upright on the top because that's what we're told happens. And then upside down on the bottom and then hanging sideways on the side altogether. Instead, it's very often we have these, these snapshots or even the pictures from the moon, which a lot of people question, we get a disc, we don't get a full sphere, we get a circle on a screen. So there's so many things we don't even have. Another one is, it would be great to have a picture of Earth in the solar system with the sun and all the other planets in the correct order that we're told. Where's that? The actual visual image, images and video images, number one, they come from a small number of individuals. And number two, we don't have the ones that we'd even want. So everything we see is CGI or like renderings. 
much of it is, especially from NASA. So there was a big announcement. So in 1972, they say that was the last non-composite image from the moon. And there are others that have come out, but if you look into them, they're composites of various images put together. The blue marble, which is on which was on the iPhone, and so it became very popular. The uh, there was a NASA artist who talked about this openly that it was photoshopped and that it was his own rendition of what Earth would look like. How do we not have imagery of this? I mean, we have all these guys, you know, you got Elon Musk sending stuff out into space, like a, a freaking car is out there in space, zooming around. <laughs> like, why can't it turn around and take some images? I mean, we know they're sending rovers to Mars. That's far enough away, isn't it? To be able to actually look back at Earth and take the image of, I mean, it would be just a 24 hour image to see it roaming, uh, completely revolving around. Yeah, it's very curious to me too, because we do get these snapshots where you see part of Earth from above, but we don't have the full context. And we always have to basically do mental gymnastics to infer what the rest would be. But there's also issues with the lenses themselves. There's something called a fisheye lens, which can add curvature that right. doesn't actually exist. So we, all, we have to know a lot of information about these images before we can draw conclusions. Right, and that's what I think, the very little research I've done on the flat Earth theory is I, I know a lot of it hinges or not hinges, but a lot, but some, again, I haven't done any research onto it. So I don't actually know what the whole premise hinges on, but one of the aspects I should say is the fisheye lens that I've heard about is that's what's making things look like it curves rather than the reality. That's just a perception thing because of the lenses. That's one piece that people look at. There's what I call in the book globe skepticism. It, I would call it distinct from flat earth because flat earth proposes for sure earth is one way, but globe mm -hmm. skepticism says we are told earth is a sphere, more specifically an oblate spheroid. So it's not perfectly spherical, basically a sphere with a radius value of roughly 4,000 miles. It's very specific. And many challenges to that model are looking at the radius value. For example, there are people mm -hmm. who claim they can see things that should not be visible because they should be, these objects should be blocked by Earth's curvature, and yet they can see them. So that's something that should be replicated by a lot of people, including space agencies, because shouldn't you just take out a telescope and say, well, we know the math of Earth's, this building should be blocked because it's way below the curve. Like if you were trying to see around a bend, for example, you wouldn't be able to right. see something because it's around the bend. So that these are very easy experiments that people should be able to run. Um, and then there are just so many anomalies with the globe um, that we could go into if you want, but that's often the challenge. And, and people will say, well, I'm not sure exactly what Earth is, but I know it's not a spinning globe. And this actually even comes, actually what initially got me interested, a man named Stephen A. Young, he wrote a book this year called A Fool's Wisdom. He's a theoretical physics PhD, and he came to the same conclusion where people were throwing around flat Earth, and he was like, nah, that can't be true. And he says, look, I don't know what Earth is, but the globe model has been falsified, basically. That's interesting. I think that's a better way of phrasing it is that it's skepticism. You know, that's what I say about the moon landing. I don't know if it happened or if it didn't happen, but I'm certainly not going to believe it just happened. I mean, I'm super skeptical. I don't know. I mean, it, it's possible it could have happened. Again, I don't know, but I also don't know if it did. And there's just enough evidence for me to, ex to, ex to question it and to think that there's just too, I would think that you would have guarded those tapes with your life. It, the greatest achievement of mankind, and you didn't guard those damn tapes, the greatest achievement of mankind, and you know, I mean, and, and no other country's gone back. I mean, and, and the answer is, well, they didn't need to because we did it. Oh, okay. So th that doesn't, they do everything. We, everybody copies. Just because we did it, suddenly other nations don't say, oh, I don't need to do it now. I don't need to make a phone because they made the phone. So I don't need to make a phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like the most ridiculous idea to think, well, it's because we did it, so nobody else did. You know, there's just so many questions around it. I think a good way to frame it is skepticism. And that's it. That's interesting that, okay, maybe, but we do, have we not seen though pictures of other, it, it, isn't everything in space round that we know of, like Mars and Venus mm -hmm. and Mercury? Well, you're raising a very interesting point because often we assume that if we see something out there a certain way, then we know what is going on where we live. And that presumes, presupposes that Earth, where we live, is like the things that we see in the sky. But what if Earth is distinct? So it doesn't tell us about Earth by looking at what's above. That's, that's a, uh, yeah. it's jumping to a false conclusion or a conclusion that isn't warranted necessarily. Well, I don't know if it, you know, again, I don't know if we could jump to a conclusion because again, if, unless I've gone out there with my own eyes and seen it for myself, it's not really a conclusion as much as it is a presumption. 
But I would think that Earth is a, I would think that it's more, more, more likely it's round if everything else around it is round also. Well, I think that also uh, runs into what's known as the Copernican principle, which uh, Copernicus basically pushed the heliocentric model that the sun's at the center rather than Earth. And for the last several hundred years, we've been in that model. But the Copernican principle basically posits that Earth does not occupy a special place in the cosmos, that we're just one of many others. And in the book, I challenge that from many perspectives, including the cosmic microwave background. There's a lot of science that says, wait, maybe Earth does occupy a special place, in which case the notion that where we live is distinct from the lights that we see in the sky, that that's more plausible to me. But also, I just think from a logical perspective, it's this the analogy that's often given is that we don't necessarily know about the ceiling by studying, excuse me, we don't know about the floor by studying the ceiling. I mean, there is something that is very distinct about Earth that we don't have in the in the objects around us, and that's life, right? We have a very distinct ecosystem, a very distinct, um, you know, life on Earth is very distinct and different. So I guess one could then come to the you know possibility that Earth is different because there is right. some there are some real distinct differences already that we can observe. So perhaps at least it is different at least as a possibility. But one thought that comes to mind, Kim, is if Earth were a sphere, it shouldn't it be really easy to just dig all the way down and then end out on the other side of space on the bottom? And so the problem is we've only been able to dig down under eight miles. That's the farthest any digging expedition has gone. And the radius value is 4,000. If we went all the way, it would be over like roughly 8,000 miles. So mm -hmm. there are all these problems consistently. When I, I was trying to disprove what I was hearing of all the skeptics, and every time I'm like, well, I actually can't prove the current model. Another one that would be really nice is if we could freely and privately explore all of Earth. And one of the common objections is, well, since the 1959 Antarctic Treaty, which interestingly was signed by the US and the Soviet Union, among others, but the US and the Soviet Union were supposed to be in a Cold War. They also signed a space treaty, so that's interesting. But in any event, it restricts free and private access of Antarctica below the 60th South latitude. And yeah. that doesn't mean, you know, some people go to parts of Antarctica, but we need to explore the whole thing to know exactly what it is, every part of it. And that's restricted. So we actually don't have the ability right now with our current knowledge to know what Earth is. Well, and that's what I find so strange is even when I, I just love uh, for fun, I go onto Google Maps or Apple Maps and I'll go to places in, in the world and, and do like street view walkthroughs or you know, just to see what different places are like and, and all of this. And one thing that I find so strange is when I zoom out and I get the globe, I can spin the globe around, but you know what I can't do? I can't spin it upside down. I can't see all of Antarctica. It doesn't let me. Mm -hmm. It does like, like as if satellites are like, how is that possible? Elon Musk has got Starlink, right? Just like gridded around the earth, like a blanket. And yet why do we not have imagery straight on of Antarctica? Why can I not spin the globe like that? It's very interesting. And I want to, one other thing on Antarctica that really piqued my interest in this. There's something called magnetic declination. Basically the magnetic poles of earth don't match with the geographic poles. So the magnetic poles move around and it's believed that that's the case because the magnetic field comes from earth's core, which we've never been to. And it's right. because of a geodynamo effect, which has never been replicated of the outer core spinning a certain way. So basically it's a, a guess about how earth's magnetic field, such an important thing even exists. The problem is that this has real world implications for navigation because we need compasses to get to the right geographic location. Right. We have right. to manually adjust compasses, especially near Antarctica. It gets really, really bad where there's a website anyone can go to magnetic-declination.com. You could see what the adjustment needed would be. And in Antarctica, at one point, like I quoted in my book, it's negative 178 degrees. So they're basically saying, whatever your compass is telling you, you have to turn around, then you'll get to the right place. It goes haywire. What's interesting is that if you took a flat map and put it around a sphere, you would have to really, so the flat map, quote unquote, which again, we can't, we can't know for sure, it says that Earth is a circle, mm -hmm. basically in a lake, surrounded by an ice wall. And that's Antarctica. So Antarctica is not a mm. continent. That's the theory. Of course, we couldn't know right. this for sure. But if you took right. that this as a base, what I've heard up from, yeah, I've heard this one from flat Earth from the flat Earth, you know, theory, which is that there's this right a giant ice wall. But then, how do you giant get? Ice. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. But I, let me continue. Then I'll pause. But what's okay. interesting, if you just think, if you just hold that as a possibility, if you were to take that quote unquote flat, you know, circular Earth map and put it around a sphere, you'd have to really compress the outer parts, which is Antarctica 
into this little ball at the bottom of the sphere. So it is interesting that the compasses go haywire, especially below the 60th south latitude where we're not allowed to freely and privately explore. So there are these anomalies that are just interesting to me, like also at the equator, which is where the two maps would most closely align. That's where you need the least amount of navigation adjustment on compasses for the magnetic field. So like these are things that we have to solve one way or the other, flat or not. Like why is why are the poles moving around like this? We don't understand it. And why do you have to manually adjust compasses to get to the right place? And they just take it, like, what does a pilot say about that? Or do they just say, well, it is what it is. I don't know. This I was talking to a pilot. Taught. Yeah, I was talking to a former pilot the other day who said, yeah, this is what we were taught. We just, you just use these charts, you adjust. Because <laughs> that's how it goes. They say, yeah, I don't know. this is what you do. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's just what I'm told. Thank you so much for watching. This was just a clip from the longer, larger show that you can catch Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern at KimIversonShow.com. That'll route you to the platform where you need to be in order to get the full uncensored show every Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Click on that link. Watch the full interview. See you there.